Uh, thanks for coming over here after, I think, lunch. Didn't actually pay attention since I didn't go to it. Um, but yeah, so our talk is titled 11 Tricks. Um, we're going to be basically giving you some tips and tricks around Kubernetes. Um, the 11 is not actually the case because of this lovely thing called inflation. So we actually end up having a bunch more than that. So this, the original version of this talk was created by Jerome Pettizzoni and me, and actually the first time it was ever given was in the UK, in London, uh, at KCD. But we've changed some stuff around, and um, this obviously is not Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, hi, um, I'm Tiffany Jernigan. Um, I most recently was a developer advocate at VMware. I guess this is the first time in a talk where I'm publicly saying I got laid off. So if you're hiring for DevRel, please let me know. Um, I have my website there, which has a bunch of talks that I just did recently and a bunch more that I'm still doing since even though I'm not currently working for anyone, um, I really like meeting new people and teaching people new stuff and just all the things that come along with awesome conferences like DevOps. And if you use X or Twitter still, which seems to be less and less, um, that is my Twitter handle there. Okay. Thanks, Tiffany. And, um, also, uh, hello to you and, and thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, my name is obviously not Jerome, it's also written here. My name is Matthias. Um, I work for a company called Novatech um, uh, with a focus on the technology space, in particular in the area of cloud native software engineering. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I also use Twitter still, but most of the things kind of shifted a little bit to LinkedIn. So if you really want to get in touch, probably LinkedIn is, is a better way to connect. Okay, so we only have a half an hour for this. Um, we Kind of going to split, it's called tools in action, but we still have a bit of a like slideware um, around to, to support that. So we're probably going to switch between interacting live and showing things on the slide. I hope you can follow enough. For, uh, unfortunately, the screen is not super big. Um, if, you, if you can't read it well or have problems in the background, please raise your hand or try to make maybe move a little forward. There are still some empty seats there, so you can actually see the things we are, we are doing. And also the QR code on every page should be for these slides. Right. OK. OK, good. So I'm going to start with the um, first tip in working with Kubernetes is actually to use Kubernetes. Otherwise, this wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um, if, if you want to do that, normally um, people a lot uh, take Kubernetes as a service from major cloud providers. But if you just want to play around and get familiar with it, there is a bunch of options to run Kubernetes in a local environment. Uh, there is, yeah, most people would have Docker. And on Docker Desktop, there's a Kubernetes option. There's K3D, Kind, Colima, Minikube, Orsec, and so on. More and more are getting added. Um, so we're going to use Kind for the, for the demo today. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so basically, this needs an underlying uh, container engine. I'm having Docker on my machine, and this is like the mini specification that you would need to do to run a cluster with one control plane and three worker nodes. So I'm going to switch to that. I hope this is, is readable. Um, so I'm going to say, well, I'm going to create a smaller one. It's only called double YAML, so it only has a control plane and one worker node. Um, and this is basically the only thing you need to do to spin that up. So I'm going to let that run in the background, move forward here a little bit. Um, to show another option, um, I'm not going to demo this, this today. Um, this is basically using a thing called dev container, where you can specify a development environment in the container configuration. You can also do that specifying uh, a Kubernetes feature here, which comes with Helm and, and Minikube. Um, and that also gives you the possibility, for example, to run it somewhere on the cloud in GitHub code spaces if you have some issues for whatever reason to run the things on your local environment. I'm going to give a talk tomorrow on that topic, um, and we'll come to that later. Uh, so for today, this is going to be, be it from that side. Now, in the meantime, this has probably started. So it says, yeah, um, it's, um, it, it's ready to go. And very often, people come with the scenario that you don't have only one cluster. You probably have many. You have development environments, productive environments, playground environments, and so on. And to switch between those, there is the call kubectl config set context, blah, blah, blah. And also to switch between namespaces, you also have that context thing. So one of the, 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 the problems with Kubernetes, especially in the beginning, is to know all that by heart, what you have to type in into the console. And a lot of the things that make Kubernetes easier is kind of shortcut them, maybe alias them, or use some, some mini tools to, to help you with. Two of them are called kubeNS and kubectx. 
Um, you can see here that this is a, a tooling where you can say from your local machine with kubectx, you can easily switch between the contexts um, of different clusters. And within those contexts with kubeNS, you can switch between the namespaces. So for example, in my case, if I say kubectx now, it's going to show me all the various clusters that I have access to. So it's going to read my kube config file. And um, this is like that kind cluster that I just created. Um, but I also could say, OK, I want to point to my Docker desktop cluster, or I want to connect to, my, um, to an online one, which is, which is running in the cloud. So that makes it easy to switch. And in the same way, I can use kubeNS, which will list all the, the namespaces. And then I can basically select the namespace that I, that I want to use. All right. Um, this is the same thing, just in a text form. So you create, create a namespace, use kubeNS. And also, one of the things that I use is that FZF, Fuzzy File Search, um, that basically just brought up that menu uh, and adds a little bit of extra convenience. And with KNS, minus, the minus, it basically switches to the previous configuration. Um, another helpful thing in the same environment is using aliases. I guess most of you have seen that top alias. Who, is, who has been using K instead of kubectl? OK. Who has never been using kubectl? OK. Well, then um, this is certainly, it goes from seven characters down to one. Um, and in this case, you can basically just, um, I have it already enabled, but this is the way you do it. So you can say kubectl, get deploy, um, replica set, pod, and uh, service. And then all the things going to get listed. Um, this is an easy one. Now, who has seen that before? Does anyone have a guess what that means? It's, I didn't make this up. This really exists. Any volunteers? No? System events, Y. The output Y. Ah, you're close. So it's kubectl get minus namespace cube system get stateful sets minus O wide minus show labels. And obviously, um, this is basically what it all wraps. And with that, certainly um, you can shortcut things. But on, on the other way, it's like learning an own new language. Um, there's a, a list of things with about 800 different aliases. Um, I, know, I don't really use it much, but as some of my colleagues, they do that extensively, and they can't live without it. So um, if I go to my environment and say K and do a tap, I already see that's a lot of possibilities there. Um, and no. <laughs> and this is uh, your yes. German keyboard, yeah, not this is, mine. This, yeah, this is not actually my computer, so I shouldn't say that. So you see there are plenty. Um, so this is like something to spend an evening with. Um, all right. This is the part for, 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 my, for me to start, so I'm going to pass it on to, to Tiffany now. Sweet. OK, so who here has heard of kubectl wait before? No, but like two people? OK. All right, so um, basically, like you can go and just like create some sort of resource. It could be a deployment. It could be a node. It, just whatever type of resource that you may want to create. Um, you can do a, your regular create. If you just go and create something, it usually just finishes and says, hey, you're basically, a t you th might think that it's already created, it's already done, but that's not necessarily true. So like if we go over here, and if we did a create, if we do a get deployment, German keyboard. Um, OK, actually, we are going to switch to a different cluster. OK, so right now we can see that there is only one that it's trying to create one, but it's not ready. But if you look here, it makes it seem like it's already done. Um, that's that can be a problem if you're doing some sort of like scripting, for instance. Basically, you need to have your resources up and ready before you actually try doing something with them. You can't actually go and launch any pods on a, like a node if you don't have your node up and ready. You, there's, you can't go to your website if your service isn't up and ready. So basically, there's just a bunch of different things that you can do with that. So if I did, a, you can do a wait. So basically, we have this thing here. So it's just waiting for a specific condition. So for instance here, we can wait for the condition to be available. I mean, basically, depending on how the 
internet you have is uh, that could take longer or not. Um, so if we look back over here, um, basically there, you need to know what kind of conditions you can specifically go and wait for. So each different type of resource has a different type of condition potentially. Um, the command here doesn't necessarily show all the different conditions that are out there, but it can give you some of them at least. So if we do uh, go and check for conditions, so this one timed out. Uh, if we were to just, for instance, take a look and see our deployments again, um, for some reason, um, it is not up and ready. So we can take a look into that if there's time or if we run into further issues, basically. Um, but yeah, if we go and do a uh, cube at all get deployments, and if we do... Wait, there's... A... Is this, you don't have the Y. Yeah, okay, that's better, that's correct. Now, it was the Y and Z thing of the German keyboard. Oh, right. I'm American, so the keyboard letters are a little swapped, so there's typos that end up happening. There we go. So if we go here, um, basically we can see that for deployments that the two different conditions that you can specifically wait on are whether it's available or whether it's progressing. Um, so then you can use that for different resources and checking that out. Okay, so you can also do this for basically for like a service, for instance. So we could go and there's a couple ways to create a service. You could do expose, you could do create service. Um, so for instance, if we go back over here, if we do an expose, One day. <laughs> Even the equal sign is in a different place. Okay. So basically, if we went into that, we could do a wait on the endpoints. Okay. So um, since uh, around 128, Instead of having to do this whole whole path of getting to like say I want the IP, you don't have to know whether it's under like spec and like all the layers down that you have to go to figure out where it is because that can be kind of obnoxious. Um, so you can actually just do dot dot uh, IP and then it can go and wait for that. Do you know if we're connected to the internet? I'm pretty sure we are. Um... Uh, well, we'll connect it to this network, but um, well, I, I'll switch to my to my mobile. This is uh, okay. We're connected to the internet now. <laughs> As you can see, this is all live. We have not recorded every, anything, um, and we, we, maybe we should have. <laughs> Did you switch tabs? Okay. Yeah, you can go back to that tab. So that's all. Not that tab. That, that one. <laughs> Okay, let's just go and check our deployments. Okay, so it seems like it's internet issues. Uh, so basically, if we did a if we did a wait on the endpoints now. Okay, cool, internet, yay! Uh, so basically, now you can just go and see that that condition is met. So if there's another level of this. So right now, this is just if you're, say, using the default service, which is just for a cluster IP. If you want to actually go and have a load balancer, it's not sufficient to just check for the endpoint. You also want to make sure that you're ex you have an external IP that is up to be able to actually access have someone else be able to access that. So if we were to go over to like a, one of the other uh, pr like one of the cloud providers, um, then basically I could do. Uh, kubectx, kubectx, and then if we go back over here, and then if I just go to kubeNS and default, that way I don't mess with whatever else that he has running, <laughs> because that would not be the best thing ever. Um, so basically, uh, if we, so we already, I already created the uh, deployment so that I don't have to go and do that. Um, doing the endpoints thing is exactly the same, but if we were to do like a kubectl wait for service, or I guess I first I'd expose it. So basically, instead of just doing a regular expose, you do it with a dash dash type load balancer to specify that you want that. And um, 
it's well port 80 because this is just nginx um, and then giving it a specific name uh, because I already have well like for instance if I was still using the same cluster there would be a name conflict that was there so if I were to go and expose that so then if I did a wait on the service you could basically just end up waiting for that for all, and then you'll actually end up being able, once this is done. So if I get, go here, if I do k get service, we can see that I have an external IP. Okay, so um, there's a few things that you need to know when it comes to cube cuddle wait. So for one, uh, the default timeout is 30 seconds. Uh, we saw earlier that we did run into a timeout based on internet connectivity. Um, you could have zero, which basically goes and just checks once and reports the status. You can have a max value, which is using a negative value, which is to wait a week. Not entirely sure. A week. <laughs> Not entirely sure what you're waiting but on for a week. If you find yourself using that option too often, you might consider changing your provider because the, a week should certainly too long. Or, or maybe it's the internet connection. Um, so you can also wait for something to delete as well. You might have certain things that are dependent on something else being gone, et cetera. So who here has tried in some capacity to turn a deployment on and off again? All right. <laughs> so many hands. <laughs> so we do know that for a lot of things, just turning things on and off again slowly and magically works. You don't necessarily know why uh, it would be good to, but hey, at least I didn't spend hours and now it works. Um, so there's a few ways that you can kind of go about doing that with deployments and such. So one way is with kubectl rollout. Who has ever used kubectl rollout? Okay, a few hands. Okay, so basically what happens here is it ends up restarting your deployment. So your pod that you already have, pod or pods that you have running will go away. It'll start new ones up. All it's basically doing is adding an annotation, which is triggering an update. So if we go back over here, so if I did, I'm just going to go back to my kind cluster or attempt to because German keyboards. <laughs> okay. So if I did a rollout restart, actually, let's just take a look here first. So if I do a okay, kget pods, we can see that we have one right now. It's ending in this random uh, 7 mfk 7 So if I were to go and do a rollout restart on that, if I do a get pods right now, we can actually see that one is going down and another one is coming back up. Okay. So then basically to like verify that that's actually doing what you think it is. I mean, yes, one is going down, one is coming back up, but maybe something else failed. Maybe it's not because you specifically did a restart on it. So what you could do is you can actually check for the annotation. So we can see that it's uh, the 8th or of May. I'm just like directions because Americans kind of slop it, 5885, you know. But uh, basically, we can see that we we're just going and doing that. So that is what we just changed. OK. So that doesn't actually turn it completely off and on again. It just basically restarts it. Uh, who knew that you can actually scale to 0? OK, the biggest number of hands in the room so far. Cool. OK, so yeah, basically, so right now, if we look at our deployment, which will forever keep being deplaws because keyboard. <laughs> so right now, we just have one. So like maybe a lot of people might do a scale. So maybe you more commonly scaled something to two. So if you're like, oh, hey, OK, I have two of them. But you can do the same thing and basically scale it to 0. And if you get your deployments, then now you don't have any anymore. And the thing about this one, unlike the rollout, is if I keep staring at this for and make you all stare at this for the next 11 minutes of the talk, it will still be zero. All right. So why, though? Um, <laughs> that was a nice image from Jerome. Every time I see it, I laugh. So I've kept it there. Um, yeah, so there's like a few reasons why you might want to do that. So for instance, there be, might be resources that you aren't currently using, but you plan on using. Um, so you can do that with that. You could use auto scaling to handle some of the things with it. Um, there's a bit of a challenge with Kubernetes. The auto scaling relies on like either CPU, memory, utilization things. And if you don't have any pods running, 
you don't have any of that. So. Did I do that? Okay. I did that. Actually, it's my yeah. head. We swapped it. All right. <laughs> never mind. Stay over there. <laughs> okay. So who here has generated a YAML manifest? Okay. Who here knew you have to deal with YAML to some extent if you want to touch Kubernetes? <laughs> okay. So um, there's a few ways to uh, handle dealing with YAML. Um, there's a few ways where you don't have to deal with having docs or external websites or chat GPT, et cetera. And these things are pretty helpful, especially if you are trying to do any of the like uh, CCAD, CKA, et cetera, exams. So um, one of them is to use Datchash dry run equals client. Uh, who knew about this one so far? Okay. So if we go back over here, Okay, so basically, if we're going, it's basically everything that we saw before of just how you go and create a deployment, um, doing o dash o YAML to get YAML specifically, and if we do dash dry run client, we can basically see we get the whole YAML of what you would are basically uh, sending to the Kubernetes API. So this has stuff that you don't necessarily care about with the default values that are like null or empty, but this can be super useful if you're like, I need to create this thing and I need to change something. For instance, like if you're creating a role binding using just the flags, it doesn't necessarily give you every option that you would want to be able to create it. So you could start at this point and then build upon it basically. So um, depending on how you have, uh, your terminal setup. This one's a little, we didn't fully figure out what was going on with ZSH, but um, if you are using bash basically to be lazy or just save time, especially if you're doing a, a CCAD for instance, where time matters, um, you could end up exporting dr uh, dry to dry run client equal dash o YAML. And so that way you don't have to go and type that. Basically anything that you can do to make less typing happen for these types of things, uh, the better off you are. Um, all right, so who's heard of kubectl patch? Okay, so uh, basically, if we were to go and look at our deployment, uh, we can see right now that basically um, we have, let's see, we have one container here, we have the image nginx, and we have a name nginx. If we're like, if we look back over here, um, some people might think that this will go and just, you know, change the name and change the image. What in fact will actually happen is it will end up creating, uh, having it have two containers because it cares about what the key is and then it adds the image based on that. So if we did, Okay, so if we did this here. If we did a uh, git deployment o YAML again, we can actually see that uh, basically now we have two containers and that may not be exactly what you wanted to do. So there's a way to go and fix that. Um, basically, it's a little more uh, hard to like read in a bit because you actually have to spe specify things um, using JSON. Um, but basically you could do another patch on it and go and remove what you have. So if we were to go back here, and then if we look at our deployment again, um, we can see that we fixed that problem. But basically, like that's a little confusing. Sometimes you could try doing a kubectl edit, and that might be a bit of an issue too. Um, another way of going about it instead is to use kubectl set. Who has heard of that one? Okay, like almost no one. So yeah, basically instead of having to do patches, having to do kubectl edit and changing a bunch of values, you could just do a kubectl set on whatever resource it is. And so like the deployment, I can go and change what the image is by just doing kubectl set. You could change things for service accounts. You could set this for multiple deployments. You just need to be careful because say if the service account doesn't exist, then now you just gave all your deployments a service account that doesn't exist and everything is going to fail. But these are just some things that you can go and end up changing. So I think this is also still me. <laughs> so we have six minutes left. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, basically this one, uh, like 
you can uh, label your columns and basically be like, hey, I want to have instance type. I want topology. I want to have the zone. And you can and therefore get all these different things here. Obviously, if you're running on kind, there's some of these things that you aren't going to get. And it's pretty useful, like just here being able to see the different types of architecture, et cetera. Um, you can also see like which controllers own your specific pods. Um, so basically, you could have custom columns. And then if we do, oops. So right now, I don't have any pods specifically in here, uh, but let's see. Just, I don't know how to use Just up. do Kubernetes and then ping yeah. it. Yeah, that works. Okay, so then basically you can see like the ownership of different things there. Um, and then there's the ability to actually hide headers, which is super useful because basically if you are like, hey, I want to get my nodes, but I don't, I want to put this maybe into some script. I want to do something with the data you can actually just get it to remove what that specific header is and not have it say like uh, what pool it is and all those other things there. So, yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, four minutes left. Uh, I'll try to, try to give my best. I mean, yeah, if you can see that, there are plenty of things that you can do. Now, maybe uh, a, a bit of an excursion towards security. I think this is the first time ever I talk about that. Um, so, um, there's this thing called kubectl auth. So, let me go back here. And um, one of the things that we don't have in our slide is also the thing that cube, the kubectl has a pretty good built-in help. So if I do kubectl auth, um, can I? And that's basically, and then say, for example, minus help, it would give me some examples. So I can, for example, say kubectl, can I create pods in all namespaces? This is almost like chat GPT here. Yeah? So I, I talk with Kubernetes and it says yes. So I'm tempted to say thank you, but this come out will not work. Um, and if I just want to get a list of all the things that I can, um, I don't do help, I do list. And that in this case would show me I have basically full access to all the resources. But I can certainly break this down and say, um, I want to set myself into the role, for example, the, the cube scheduler. And um, then I would do this, run the same command. And you see, it, it's, it's different to what I had before. So this one is not able to do it, things in the same way as, as I have before. OK. Um, what else can we do? Um, most of well, we have seen the, 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 the watch stuff before. Um, this one has also this output watch events. I'm not sure. This was actually pretty new for me as well. So if you do like a kubectl watch and um, I do the pods and show them all in white. I'm going to make it a little smaller now to, because white pretty much prints all the things in. Um, and now I'm going to add the, now I'm going to stop this because this goes into the foreground. And if I use the um, kubectl output watch events, you see that initial column right there, this edit kind of thing. So if I switch the namespace again and say probably go to, to default, do we have any pod here? No. Um, maybe I change the cluster real quick. Um, QNS. OK, get pod. Yeah, we have that one. And what I'm going to do now is I'm repeating that watch command, um, put that into the foreground, and then I'm going to switch to another terminal and do that um, rollout. So this is going to restart the thing. And if I go back here, then I should be hopefully, oh, wait, press enter. <laughs> Um, now, I get all these kind of changes on that resources. Um, I mean, th this one is what I would see before as well, but now I can see it. This, this one has been modified. It ended up a state of running again. This is the new pod, and the old one has been terminated and went away. So this can be helpful if you really want to track the status changes of the individual resources. And you can also put that the output into JSON. That basically means uh, you can uh, write in Kubernetes controllers with shell scripts. I'm not sure if this is what you want to do, but potentially you could. Um, yeah, finally, we have um, one minute left, and uh, I'm going to, I think, leave it with that. So 
basically we have all the API resources. Um, this is basically all the access that I have to, uh, I have access to, and then I can say kubectl explain um, deploy, and that would give me like the, the top level information. And I could say kubectl explain deploy dot spec, which is like the nest, uh, sorry, the next nesting level, and um, and I could also say minus minus recursive which would give me the entire object of this current cluster that I have. So if I have different clusters with different API versions, like the JSON structure might not always be the same, but this would give me always the, the, the real truth of what I have and would also enable me to like, build the right JSON paths of things. So I think we have to stop at this point. As I said, we, you're going to get the slides. Um, and um, there's definitely more tools. There's more talks also. I have one tomorrow, Tiffany has one tomorrow, and I also have a lab on the Friday. So it would be really cool to see you all again. Sorry for wrapping that up so quickly, but I see the red flag here. Time is up, and I just want to say yeah. thanks very much for listening. <laughs> I'm not sure if we have any time for questions, but I, I have one question. If, if you see us on, out in the hallway and you have something that you say, this helped me in particular when I got started with Kubernetes and the kubectl, and you didn't have it in your talk, let us know. We're happy to add it for the next iteration. Thanks again.